Hello, everybody, to our cyber panel. This is the uh, third edition of this panel. A couple of panels over the time changed, but this remained the cyber panel. We started in the first year with hybrid threats, talking about disinformation campaigns. Um, that was back in 2020. Um, a lot has changed has changed since then. Um, and then last year we talked about um, the EU, NATO, for the first time, we got a little bit into cyber warfare. And, and now on this panel, we attempt uh, to talk about cybersecurity and bringing it together with uh, AI. Cybersecurity is one of the major challenges. I don't have to tell um, each and every one of you uh, that this is um, a major factor in foreign and security policy and has been over the last years. Large scale uh, disruptions in cyberspace uh, can have major uh, impacts on our critical infrastructure, on the economic systems and our everyday lives. Cyber warfare also has become a prevalent terminology for a, a new technological, for all two new technological applications and systems on the battlefield, as well as for ways to weaken the enemy with all kinds of technological disruptions. But interestingly, decision makers are still remarkably hesitant to follow clear pathways um, for reinforced cybersecurity. Uh, just recently, we, with, we witnessed that um, with the German government that a couple of days ago, uh, introduced uh, more details about the special budget for the German armed forces, and cybersecurity will not feature. And all this comes at a time when new technological developments such as, as AI and machine learning are already making their way into cyberspace. All this might be, on the one hand, to a lack, uh, due to a lack of definitional precision, um, but also maybe because of its complexity. And today we want to talk about the state of cybersecurity, uh, the role of AI in most pressing issues in this area, and then attempt to bring the two together and look at potential avenues for policy developments in Europe. With me on stage here today are, first of all, uh, Sasha Borovic. Sasha uh, served as Ukraine's first deputy minister of the economy and deputy governor between 2015 and 2016. Uh, before that, he consulted and co-founded various startups in the U.S., U.K., and Germany. And Sasha currently holds a general counsel position with Helsing, a startup at the nexus of defense and AI. Uh, second uh, of all here today, uh, Professor Dr. Joachim Posega. Joachim is a computer scientist and professor for IT security at the University of Passau, formerly affiliated with the University of Hamburg, um, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and the University of Edinburgh. Prior to his academic career, he was working in the industry, holding several positions as research project and program manager at Deutsche Telekom, research, uh, SAP corporate research, and others. Joachim research addresses uh, web security, security protocols, architectures, and the current applications focus in the Internet of Things IoT. And then online, we are joined by Mark Oliver Pahl. Mark Oliver is joining us again. He has been with us uh, last year. Um, and I am particularly glad to have him on again. Um, we had an exchange on cybersecurity last year and, um, and about awareness, education, but also the EU and NATO uh, strategies. Mark Oliver is heading the chair of cybersecurity for critical network infrastructures at the IMT Atlantique in uh, Rennes, France, and stations on his academic pathway included positions at the University of Tübingen, the Technical University in Munich, Charlton University in Canada, and he is also the vice president of the German chapter of the Association for Computing uh, Machinery. In all, in all his capacities, Mark Oliver's goal is to make cybersecurity manageable through highly resilient and reliable systems. So these are our distinguished guests for today, and I'm happy to jump in. Um, the <coughs> format is the same as we have seen today with uh, Amelie in the first panel, but also over the last years. Each uh, panelist has now uh, five minutes to respond to an introduction question. After that, we'll get into uh, more questions from me, and then we'll hand over to you in the audience, but also you online. Mark Oliver, you're the, <laughs> you're the first singer <clears throat> last year. Um, set the stage for us. What has happened in uh, cybersecurity uh, since we last talked, and can we boil it down to new or still developing existing trends? 
yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure being with you, and thank you very much for all the great work you're doing. So it's uh, really impressive every time to see it. Um, yeah, so as you said, I'm heading an industrial chair. That is good because that means I have the academia position, uh, plus I also have the industry position. I have several industry partners that you see here behind me, um, which are major players in the cybersecurity field in Europe. <coughs> <clears throat> and um, I also know the German academic landscape uh, and uh, the German system and that's uh, also maybe starting with that quite interesting because in the uh, for French system I have the impression that the um, nation state security, the military is much more interlinked with the research with us at the institute um, than I had this impression uh, in Germany in particular at Technical University of Munich where I was working because there it was more that the University of the Bundeswehr, where my uh, dear colleague Gabi Dreo is uh, working, that they, of course, have a strong link, but uh, in, in broad, large scale, uh, I did not have the impression that it's, it's that close that it is here in France. And that's also very interesting, because it might um, show us that in uh, Germany or in other countries, uh, it could be a good idea to, uh, to stop this uh, full separation between the two, because uh, the things that we are securing are critical infrastructures, for instance, so water supply, communication, and so on. So your question was what changed uh, since my last intervention. So last time, to sum it up, my key point was uh, we depend on technology and um, a big problem at the moment is ransomware. What happened in between? Well, um, the war in Ukraine started and um, for me um, this is a catalyzer event in the sense that um, we see now how much um, we really depend on digital infrastructures. We see how which big role digital infrastructures play in that war. Um, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. So what changed for me is the awareness that we have uh, big threats coming from uh, big actors, namely nation states. We already had espionage. We have uh, something that is often still underestimated, which are misinformation campaigns. Um, and this, this is and will become more and more, uh, still remain very important. And of course, now we have a little bit of new dimension for Germany in the public perception, maybe, which is uh, the offensive cyber war. So you might have heard about the wind turbines in Germany that uh, did not work anymore because the uh, back end infrastructure was uh, not working anymore. And uh, even though it was not too much in the press, which was a little bit surprising to me, um, it really showed our dependency on digital infrastructures for everything and first of all for energy of course. Um, what happened also is that the arena shifted of, of this um, threat potential for, for the country and for the citizens shifted even more into the digital. And with that one I was just talking about the wind turbines which is directly the energy supply. But something else that we see also in a globalized economy is that we have big risks in our supply chains. So if parts of our supply chains are not working anymore, we cannot uh, continue the way we continued before. We have now tendencies of putting things back to Europe, back to Germany. Another point is the so-called metaverse. So, if, uh, so this spins it even further. So putting our existence into a digital space um, so these are interesting developments, all going towards uh, we depend almost 100% or a lot on uh, digital infrastructures. We need, uh, as, as we see now, the, the threat potential in this uh, cyberspace is growing. We need um, investments there. You said it in your, in your statement at the beginning. So um, it's very surprising if uh, the 100 million that they want to invest are not used for protecting against cyber threats um, because and I totally share your, your opinion that you said um, for me this is a key key aspect so time is uh, time is flying as always I see I have about uh, 20 seconds so um, coming to the AI so what is AI? AI is a tool for doing non-deterministic operations in uh, systems 
It can be used for defense, fast defense against something, full automation with something that we are working on. But it can also be used for attacks. So I can create attacks that it can adapt automatically much faster to uh, real concrete systems. So um, yeah, this is interesting, will be interesting. We'll come to that uh, surely in the discussion. Identity is also super important because once it's more in the digital, it's super important that I have a reliable identity that I can prove that I am me and not somebody else. What are we doing in our research? This is the last point I want to come to. We are looking at collaborative approaches for cybersecurity because uh, AI is also a chance to improve cybersecurity by collaborating in security aware and privacy aware ways between when we think now about uh, companies, between um, companies that are in uh, competition to each other. We work on new ways of putting the humans into the loop to manage this complexity because the complexity is always growing and making it more difficult to secure. And the last thing is autonomy. To manage the complexity, we need autonomy, but we cannot risk to lose the human to lose the understanding of what is happening in the systems because then we can also not manage them anymore. So this will be my opening statement. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mark Oliver. And with that, I'm uh, giving over to uh, Joachim. Joachim, AI plays, and we just heard this again, uh, an increasingly important role, particularly in cyber uh, defense and warfare. Uh, both in offensive and defense of operations. Recognizing patterns and rapid computing power are essential parts of this uh, development. And altogether, the advent of more AI-powered uh, platforms and capabilities will also result in AI systems becoming the targets of cyber attacks. All that in mind, would you consider AI more of an opportunity or a risk? <laughs> okay, thanks for the question. Well, um that's a question where you could probably talk for two hours about. So um, let me maybe just set the scene a little bit. So I'm, I'm coming from an engineering perspective. So I'd like to precisely understand what we're talking about. I'm interested in understanding systems out of their components and stuff like that. So let me set the scene a little bit in that sense and firstly make a remark about the notion of cybersecurity. Um, Cybersecurity is not very fashionable among technical people. It's a notion invented outside the technical field primarily, and um, it has an advantage because if you talk about cybersecurity, everyone thinks they know what it means. The disadvantage is it's not true. <laughs> so I'd like to visualize this a little bit with moving cybersecurity into a field that you all know about, which is a car, like driving. I mean. The car is today also a cybersecurity undertaking. So what would that actually mean in terms of the car? Cybersecurity would mean a whole lot of things. For instance, it's hard to break into that car. It's driving safely, maybe autonomously. It's reliable. It will drive if you want to drive it. This is coming into reliability, availability things. And it might even mean it's respecting your privacy in the car. So your insurance doesn't know how fast you drive, if you're speeding or not, or things like that. And this is a whole bunch of aspects of properties which are partially even contradictory. Like if you want to secure a car against a thief, this might hurt the case if you have an accident and first responders want to get you out because it's locked. So they are contradicting requirements. So this is just to say a bit that cybersecurity is something which is, has not a precise meaning. And it's a fairly complex mixture of aspects in various directions. That's just sort of the setting the scene. Now, if you look at AI, well, again, there are, <laughs> tempted to say, unfortunately, many, many aspects about that. You can attack AI systems that adversarial machine learning is actually quite an established field in IT security. So you look at things, how can you, for instance, trick a self-driving car into doing something it isn't supposed to do. That's adversarial machine learning. So you can attack the AI systems as well. And that's an interesting thing because deep in their functioning, we don't really understand how an AI system works. 
if we would understand it, we wouldn't need AI. We would probably do it something differently. But we don't really know how it works, and attacking it is something really interesting. You can also think about using AI as a tool in security. For instance, trying to be better in defense or trying to sort of test systems and things like that. Um, the AI-based offensive attacker is, I think, still not at the stage where it's something to worry about. I mean, we are seeing first scientific approaches to sort of use artificial intelligence-based systems to actually pursue attacks, but I think that's not at the stage where it's serious. This will take a few years, but I guess it's coming. So I'm afraid I don't really have a clear answer to that. Um, my intention here is just to sort of make you aware that this is really a whole bunch of aspects of questions, of approaches, of threats. And indeed, the threats are increasing. So maybe also, I'm, I'm in this field now since nearly 30 years. And if I, can, if I wrap it up in one minute, in a certain sense, it got more and more difficult. So we started what you could call cybersecurity around 2000 when the internet became consumer technology. Uh, technically speaking, <clears throat> in terms of cybersecurity, that meant we involved untrained people into the game, consumers who have not really a concrete idea how to do security management. This was the first step we saw. The second step we, see, we saw, what was also mentioned, this movement towards Internet of Things, IoT systems, Technically, that just that that means so we moved from a situation where we had servers in computing centers and people working with these servers into a world where we essentially gave up the centralized servers. We moved computing power into the field, into the everyday reality, and of course that's a threat because there it's much harder to protect it. So we are more and more building on digital infrastructures. And I must say, I have doubts if we are quick enough to catch up in terms of cybersecurity to sort of resist, say, serious attacks. We haven't seen a lot of them so far. Also in the recent conflict between Russia and Ukraine, everyone expected serious cyber attacks. It hardly happened. I mean, we saw more or less the usual things that happen in the internet, but there is, was nothing really observable which was as drastic as many people believe. And it seems that, if I may say, with this uh, vulner with this increased complexity and the underlying um, vulnerability, your answer could be probably that it's, it tends to be a risk. But we'll get back to that in a second. No. Um, Sasha, is it likely that we will we now hear, heard these different points? Um, from both the researchers, um, is it likely that we will encounter uh, automated and self-learning cyber weapons on a large scale in the future? Or simply put, what role will AI play in the future of specifically warfare and defense? Um, first of all, let me say uh, thanks for inviting me here. I also want to thank the um, groups that are supporting you, particularly the America House, um, I live a few blocks away from here, and uh, America House plays a great role for the community, and hosting the conference is a great thing. Um, it, it happened so ironically that the last time I was here, actually, uh, um, I had a meeting, I saw uh, Wolfgang Ischinger, Professor Ischinger, Ambassador Ischinger, however you will, uh, who runs the security conference, who used to run the security conference. And... Uh, I think it's, it's great that you young guys are taking over uh, because clearly the, uh, the older generation failed to provide security. Uh, as, as the situation in Ukraine unfolds, it becomes, it becomes obvious. Uh, so the, um, the, we will get to the AI, but before we, we do that, um, I want to say that AI as such doesn't exist today. It's, uh, it's a term that is used very freely. And effectively, it's, it's some algorithm training. And um, 
it can be a very simple action that the algorithm is being trained for, or it can be something very complex. What you're asking me is how complex this will, how complex this will get. Yeah, it's, I think it's better. All right. Now I'm the guy with two mic. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, so the the question is how complex the algorithms will become. Um, let's uh, let's let us imagine that we play a game of chess. It's me against all of you, and um, um, I don't know how many of you play chess. Uh, I do, and so. Before you walked into the room, I placed the face recognition uh, technology. So each of you, when you walked in, I managed to identify you. And then I managed to connect that with your social profiles. I also have an algorithm which helps me to determine how your social behavior, uh, whether you actually chess players or not. And uh, it's based on how often you go out, how many books you read, how many selfies you post, and so on, because chess players have certain profiles. In other words, I have profiled you. Now, you walk in, we play the chess. First thing you have is a collective action problem. It's all of you against me. And I know which of you are good chess players. There are just two or three people here. I will jam you. I will basically make it so that your voice will not be heard. What will I do also is I will identify some people who are not good chess players. In fact, they mix chess game of chess with some other game. And I will amplify those voices. They will be um, heard more than the others. In other words, I will start, I, I will also make it so that I will use a big database somewhere in the cloud of thousands of moves. And each move that you will suggest, I will counter with the best move that is available out there. And so I'm coming into this with certain algorithms that allow me to play you like a piano. And uh, you are not equipped to do that. So this would be our warfare in the game of chess. Now, through this conversation, what I will do is I will try to show you how this technique unfolds in Ukraine and also how it will unfold in the future warfare, how the algorithms uh, will actually uh, can be used in the combat operation, whether intellectual or actual or a combination of both. So this is where I would stop. And uh, yeah, I... I want to say a few things also. I want to say, uh, there is a, as I was coming here, I was walking through Schwabing, and it's, uh, it's uh, everyone is having a drink, coffee, or a and spritz, and, and uh, they, this, the film school seems like on a permanent vacation. And, and at the same time, we have a perfect storm going on. It's in the energy field. It's in the securities markets. It's on the uh, borders of the liberal democracies, so to say. And yet there is this feeling of normality in the society. And uh, you would have to, as young leaders, you will have to navigate through that. And I want to give two, I will give you advice for this conversation. And the first two that I want to give is apply critical thinking. You will hear a lot of stuff, including from us. Don't take that on the face of it. You'll have to question everything you hear. Critical thinking becomes a very important skill for young people. And then the second thing is, um, from very beginning of your life, you were built to live in the situation that someone has defined for you. Say, you enter the nursery or you enter the, the school, you have a schedule, and you will follow that schedule and you know when is lunch and you know when is dinner. Uh, your family will be considered to do very well the more predictable they make your life. This is time for the workshop. This is time for the bath. You enter the school, you will have exactly the same routine. They will prepare you to do with very predictable situations. The same in the university, your careers and so on. But the thing is that 
you come into the modern world and you will have to deal uh, with many undefined situations. And so you, there is one group in the society that is kind of prepared for that. It's people, or, uh, it's people from malfunctioning families because they never know what is expecting them when they come home, but they have some other things going on. And so you'll have to teach your brain either through learning theory of probabilities or game theory or whatever that would be. You have to apply, um, you'll have to get that knowledge so that you're prepared to deal with, uh, with uh, undefined situations. Okay, well, I'll pause here and we'll get to the AI, which doesn't exist uh, in, uh, in a short while. And <clears throat> I'm really mu uh, very much looking forward to that in a couple minutes. But that was um, already a pretty good uh, stage setting exercise by all the panelists here. Um, and let's dive a little bit deeper into a couple of these points here. Mark Oliver, um, again, a question for you. So we just heard over the last 22 years, um, according to Joachim, we became more dependent. And with this dependency on certain uh, technological appliance uh, applications, we, uh, there's also a huge vulnerability coming. And then now we heard also the complexity that um, from Sasha that is so much increasing right now. Um, how do last year we talked about strengthening awareness, um, but as we are still in this process of strengthening awareness, um, we we are met with even more complexity. So, what would you say? Uh, what would you want people to understand about the needs and experiences with regards to AI and cybersecurity? <clears throat> How can we strengthen this awareness? And this, I try to connect this to what we talked about last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very good point. So let, let me start with something that I find super important, um, which um, was the statement, we do not know how AI works. Even though I agree to the point behind it, um, we know exactly how AI works because it's just statistical nodes that are connected that are doing something. What we do not know is for certain machine learning techniques, we learn them something and then they have some emerging behavior. So they learn something and the result is just a row of uh, numbers and we cannot explain intuitively what the, how this row of numbers correlates now to the detection of this is my face, for instance. And therefore, um, we do not exactly know how, the, uh, we do not, cannot explain how the system comes to a result, but we can explain each step in the system only through the complexity of these small nodes that are connected. We do not, we cannot explain the entire thing. And uh, there are works going on into that direction, but it's not obvious how or if we can uh, arrive there. Um, second comment to that, big data was a big uh, buzzword some time ago, and uh, humans are, there are not enough humans to make sense of the big data. The AI, as it works, um, fuzzy, so similar to our brain, so it can work with data that he has never seen and still classify them, is now a possibility to make sense of this data. And linking to your question, if you take this home, it's, it's already a lot because then you know that AI is um, something mathematical that we apply having an input. We learn something to this so-called neural network and then it can classify something that it has never seen. And therefore it's also important for autonomous driving. It could equally be used for warfare, saying, okay, I'm the target, uh, the um, missile is recognizing me and targeting me based on camera images. Without um, AI and its fuzziness or machine learning and its fuzziness, uh, this solving this uh, problem would be much, uh, much more difficult. Um, complexity awareness. Um, so what I would say, what people should be aware of is as we move into this digital world, the things that you perceive are not necessarily the way um, you think they are. Um, to be more concrete, uh, buzzword or keyword deep fakes. Um, so I, if I would apply a technology that is available uh, openly, I could now change my appearance to Moritz and change my voice uh, to his. And as our lives are moving more and more into the digital, for me, this is a huge threat because uh, starting latest with the Iraq war, but also earlier, we know the power of pictures. For humans, it's uh, super important and easy to work with images. And therefore, we believe often that what we see is true. And uh, framing is already something, but deep fakes is on a totally new level. 
And uh, this is something where we also need AI in, in order to, um, to implement it. And uh, last point maybe, so um, AI is a powerful technology for defense and uh, for offense. Um, AI does not exist, I agree, so artificial intelligence in the sense we have a human um, in the scientific mindset, uh, not scientific, in the um, science fiction mindset is not existing, but machine learning is a very interesting and capable tool um, that we should master to a certain extent in order to understand um, the potential and the risks. Thank you, uh, Mark Oliver. And I think that we should stick here with the, and what you also said before, with the state-centered, um, or the this new uh, actors that are nation states coming on stage with this, and with a couple of these applications here. Um, given that infamous examples like, this is a question for you, Joachim, given that infamous examples like Stuxnet already featured very basic uh, capabilities of target selection and infiltration routines. Um, how do you specifically now assess the risk of AI-powered cyber attacks on military and dual-use infrastructures, especially with regard to escalations from digital or kinetic attacks? Okay. Um, I'd like to start with agreeing with you what you said about AI and just make another remark on that. Um, at a certain point in time, people started to call machine learning AI. And this is a big part of the confusion, because machine learning is actually something comparably old. I started in the 80s and already heard a lecture on machine learning. And this is what falls today ex more or less exclusively under AI. So you're completely right. I mean, what's the beauty of chess? In a sense, mathematically, it's the huge search base, the large numbers. And this is something, let's say in the 80s, machine learning didn't work very well because we didn't have the computing power, we didn't have the opportunities to store the data. And all this is around today, and this is why AI-based systems are incredibly good in chess and beat nearly everyone, I think. But this is just number crunching in a certain sense. What AI-based systems, I actually would prefer to call them machine learning-based systems, lack is creativity. And this is also the point why I'm not much worried about machine learning based attack systems. Uh, why? If you look at machine learning, it sort of abstracts from known things. You train the systems with examples. Now, if you think in terms of attacking an infrastructure or something, I would train the system with successful attacks. As soon as I know a successful attack, it's easy to mitigate. And if I do my homework, all the successful attacks won't work. And this is why I have, in principle, say, from this perspective, doubts that machine learning-based attacks will be really as traumatic as many people think at the moment. I'm quite skeptical there. I might be wrong. You never know. I've, I've been wrong in my lifetime so often. <laughs> but for the moment, I would say in the foreseeable time, which is in computer science, something like three or four years, <laughs> um, it's probably not going to be that bad. As to cyber warfare, well, you mentioned Stuxnet, which was sort of the beginning of a race, and uh, I don't think they, they used any machine learning in that things. These were handcrafted attacks, uh, which where a lot of effort, a lot of person power was moved in, and it was, uh, I guess, from a military perspective, very successful. It was comparably cheap, if you compare it to classical warfare with rockets, and I don't know what, I'm not sure where it goes, but I think it was comparably cheap. It hardly gave any bad press, no dead bodies or something, um, and it didn't have any bad consequences. So... I'm, I have little understanding of how military people think, but naively I would say they must conclude that this was a tremendous success um, out of this thinking. So how much do I have to invest in it? What do I get out of it? What are the consequences? And that, in that sense, it must have been considered as really very successful. And I'm quite convinced this was a start of things being prepared in the background where, of course, we don't know what's, what's happening in detail, but I think this was really the start of a 
military offensive technology approach towards cyber attacks. And I think at a certain point it'll come. We'll see it. So far we didn't. <clears throat> and I'm a bit surprised by that, but it didn't really happen. And um, there are, as I said, we are really vulnerable. I think one of the most critical vulnerabilities uh, is what uh, Mark mentioned, supply chain attacks. So if you think how systems are built today, it's not uncommon that you sort of grab, I don't know, <laughs> megabytes, gigabytes from GitHub and merge everything together. And if you talk to these people who built these systems, I worked in the software industry for quite a while, and ask them, what do you know about the code you embed in your system? Then the answer is barely anything. So we build our critical infrastructures very often on pillars we know very, very little about. And if someone really finds an efficient way to attack these pillars, then it'll be really challenging. And with that very last thought, um, I want to look over to Sasha and ask you, Sasha, um, if we now think in these terms of especially defense and automated weapon systems, what are the current innovations um, at the forefront of entrepreneurial development, especially in AI, in, in AI? But maybe you can comment also a little bit on cybersecurity. With both terms that don't exist, apparently. Right. Um, if I actually, I, I shared this slide, which uh, would be a bit blurry, but I'll help you to get through this. Um, I hope you don't mind, I get up. Uh, so. Um, those who are on the computers, they can see this better, but uh, I'll, help you, I'll help you to understand. The, the innovation in the computing is that uh, you probably are familiar with the concept of cloud computing, right? So you all have Facebook, LinkedIn uh, profiles. They are sitting in the commercial cloud, which is here, say, in the left corner, right? The military and the government, they have... Uh, something that is classified cloud, right? So this is something that is like your LinkedIn cloud, but it's a, it's more complex. It has uh, stronger password protection and whatever else. The, the servers are located in a secure location and so on. And so uh, then you have the satellites. There is about 1,500 commercial satellites going around the Earth. And you uh, then have military satellites, which no one knows uh, how many. And uh, the military satellite is believed to be able to, uh, have, uh, to, to have visibility into something as small as 15 centimeters uh, from the space. And so uh, they, satellites are producing the data. And then the data goes here in the middle. You have, say, in the military, you have the the command center that is in the field. Let's say in the context of Ukraine, there would be, uh, say, the staff, of the, the, where the chief of the staff is uh, for the Eastern Front, say, uh, for the Western Front, right? And, uh, and then you have the tactical stuff. You have the machines, you have the guns and so on. Like this is where the soldiers are. And somewhere there on the top, there are the drones, right? And so then, in the uh, in I, I talked about the the uh, the cloud computing, which would be here, and here on the right, this is called edge computing. Edge computing is where so if the cloud computing is where there is a lot of data, then the edge computing is as close to where the data is generated as possible, right? So for example, if you're running on the on the military machine, it has sensor cameras. It collects the information, and that information is data. And so now you have that data that could be processed in a certain way. Okay, and so the innovation now that you see is on the cloud computing, big companies are innovating something. Then on the edge side, smaller companies and big companies as well, but mainly smaller companies are doing something. Someone is building drones, someone is doing uh, machine guns, someone is doing artificial intelligence solutions, someone is doing modern tanks and so on. 
And so all of that is where the innovation is. And um, a lot of connection here is right now manual. So for example, in Ukraine, you, you see many drones and, and people talk about drones being used in Ukraine quite a bit. Uh, the drones are uh, taking the images of the landscape where there are, say, Russian military personnel and the tanks, and they send this information to the command, and the command sends this information to the artillery, and the artillery starts shelling the Russian positions. It is believed that if you do the shooting longer than eight minutes, you actually missed the target because the target would be constantly moving. So eight minutes, it's a very short time. And where the innovation is, is to shorten that time so that, for example, the, uh, the uh, drone would see the targets and would immediately pass the information to the artillery on the ground and the artillery immediately starts shooting and hits, hits the enemy. And now let's imagine the situation where we progress and the drones are flying on their own and artillery shoots on its own. And that would be only possible if all this is supported by strong data, which enables recognizing that this is an enemy tank and not the residential house. Uh, that it recognizes the tank when, say, the war in Ukraine started in February. It was easy to see the targets, and now it's months of uh, June. The forest is green. It's harder. So, you know, the, the, the algorithm has to be trained to see through the woods, so to say, right? The, the uh, idea is that all of these actions will become fairly uh, automated. So that um, I mentioned in the beginning that when you walked in, I had a face recognition uh, technology that recognized each of you. In Europe, we don't have much of that technology. In China, where someone is littering in the park and then, or jaywalking, uh, the moment the person comes home, the bill will arrive because the person was identified through the face recognition technology and the person is identified where the person lives. The bill arrives saying that you littered in the park or you jaywalked on the street. It's time for you to pay this bill. Uh, so you see that society like this doesn't have much respect for personal data or the same way as we do. They are training the algorithm on recognition of faces. It's the same technology that would be relatively easy to use for recognizing the military personnel of the adversary or tanks or other machinery. And so this is where countries like China, Russia, they actually have advantage because they went into the full force developing these capabilities. And we are not there. We are talking, we're not talking about the data-driven society. We are talking about protecting personal data. Instead, what we should do, we should be talking about building the data-driven society while protecting personal data. Right? But that's not where the political debate is. And that would need to change if we want to match with our capabilities, the capabilities that exist today in, in China and Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, Can I make a remark on that? Yeah, yeah that? you um, may. Go ahead. Okay. Um, that's an interesting vision. So you're sort of uh, painting the vision of, say, automate, an automated attacking system in the field in some sense. Right? Did I get it correctly? Or? So you have cloud computing parts, communication parts, 
actors and stuff like that. That's very interesting. I could, can see that AI plays a role there, but there's an interesting aspect with that. If you would build such a system, it is also incredibly vulnerable because out of its complexity, out of, out of its interdependence on communication infrastructure, satellites and everything. So you make it also easier to attack that system. And now something very interesting comes into play, because if you look at this from an IT system perspective, it's much, much harder to secure such a system than to attack that system. Yes. So um, there is some right. let me, let me real add, danger behind them. Let me respond to huh? that. So um, when the, there was a Georgia-Russian war, uh, I don't know if you remember that, and I don't know if you know how the war had started. Um, the war started the 20 minutes before the war. The Russians cracked into the drone park of the Georgian military, took all the drones, put them into the air, and moved them to the Russian territory. Uh, so drones were a big part of Georgian defense. They are very capable. But Russians managed to crack into the system, uh, take control, Put them up and move them, move them into the into Russia. Um, what is interesting now is that that we don't see happening, right? In Ukraine, there are many drones, and that is not happening. If you start analyzing why that doesn't happen, the security has improved. Russian capabilities have improved as well. At the same time, what is happening though with drones is that it's a completely decentralized system. It's, in, in Georgia, it was enough to break one key and get all the park up and move them. Now you have to get into each individual drone because the edge technology allows you to do the distributed, uh, distributed network. <clears throat> and this is where... If any, that's my next recommendation to you, if you will. Uh, when you become a leader, uh, you should, what you see the governments do a lot is they try to centralize the data and they try to nationalize the data. If you take Ukraine, for example, they have the centralized database of all the citizens, which Russians broke in, in the first days of the war. And that would not have happened if they have had a decentralized system. No one talks about any enemy breaking into the blockchain of Ethereum or Bitcoin. It's much harder to, to, to break into the distributed system. And here you would have to build in the features such as not necessarily the national cloud, which is uh, vulnerable, like say, Estonia may have the best, the best uh, uh, government as a service technology, but it's a small country of four million. If Russia attacks, how does it help them that they had the the servers in Estonia? Uh, and and in Europe, we have the laws that don't allow moving data, say, to the United States, even though it's probably more secure than you know having the data centralized. And try to decentralize as much as you can. And how I see this is that you're absolutely right. There are vulnerabilities which need to be addressed. And it would have to be very secure um, cloud. And it would have to be distributed and very secure uh, edge technology. And then there is also something that is called fog. And fog is that is on the edge of the edge, right? But I don't want to go there. But that's also <coughs> something that, that has to be, has to be uh, secured. Uh, also, speaking of the Russian capabilities, Russia has uh, six, someone said that there was no much attack. Uh, Johan said there, there was not much attack on Ukraine since the beginning of the war. I, I'd like to respond to that. Um, it's, I disagree with that. I disagree with that because I remember my chess example. I could have played this role. I could have turned the lights off in, in the room. I could have switched off the, uh, the uh, cooling system. I could have actually directed the plane so that it crashes into this building. This would be a nuclear option, so to say, for me to play chess. 
I don't want to go there. It's actually very dangerous. I think I can win this game by jamming you, by playing other strategies. So Ukraine is a subject to hundreds of thousands of attack of a smaller uh, scale. Um, the, I have reasons to believe that all the nuclear power stations are penetrated in Ukraine by Russians. I have reasons to believe that all the administrative buildings are penetrated by Russians who are in the ability to understand what's going on on the network. Russians have the technology to... Uh, how many of you have devices with Bluetooth? Pretty much everyone. So Russians have the technology that allows to turn your Bluetooth device into a microphone and hear everything that is being said on the distance of uh, 12 uh, meters around you. So that's how they are doing this now. They are not using nuclear weapons, although people talk about this risk, and they don't go for the nuclear options when it comes to cyber attacks. But, but they have those capabilities. And so that is how one needs to to perceive what is happening in the cyber warfare. They are escalating. You can see that the Russians are ready to escalate each time to be above of what the West is and Ukraine are ready to match. And uh, it may go there. But one needs to understand that the cyber warfare is just as risky as nuclear. Because uh, why are we talking about nuclear and why are we afraid of nuclear? Because because it's a massive damage and suffering to human beings. Uh, you can achieve the same with cyber warfare. You can, you can break, you can uh, turn the dam around so that the area size of France would be flooded if you, know, if you want to. Uh, and, and so that they are not doing yet, right? And I hope that will not get to that. But that's all in the arsenal of, of the uh, weapons that, that they, they have. Thank you very much, uh, Sasha. And staying with this a little bit here, but going going slightly back to cyber attacks, um, I have a question for you, Mark uh, Mark Oliver. Um, the National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology, NS NIST, clusters incident response into four phases, um, preparation, detection, uh, and analysis, containment, eradication, and recovery, post-incident and post-incident um, activity. Uh, how do you? How would you assess uh, the future of the future role of humans in this process, um, in this cycle? Then, and um, should it become completely automated and guided by an AI uh, system, given the increasing vulnerability um, of a world filled by IoT that we heard before, um, networks such as such, such as those? Do you have any um, ideas about that? <clears throat> yeah, very. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, so. Uh, a very important um, point uh, when you talk about cybersecurity is uh, that you can never fully automate cybersecurity. And the reason is that uh, cybersecurity is not an absolute term, like I have 100% cybersecurity, but it's a relative term compared to your metric. And so that means you do a risk analysis which states what is valuable for you uh, to be concrete, if you are now in a civilian environment and you have a production site, um, then uh, that uh, the cars are getting produced and you have all the supply that you need it might be your cybersecurity goal. And um, to achieve that, you will do certain measures and therefore your cybersecurity can be close to 100% for achieving these goals. But it's important that these goals do not automatically come out of the computerized process, but they come through the humans that are um, setting these goals. Coming now to the NIST cycle that you were talking about, it's a good structuring of uh, things you do um, to handle incidents, um, to do secure against them, and if they happen to do something against. And again, the system cannot take the final decision on uh, what to do now. Um, I mean, there we can, we can automate more. Uh, AI can uh, help us, but uh, to me, it can always only be in the role of an advisor. So it can do something, but the final decision has to come through the humans uh, that then say, okay, let's cut this part of the production if then I can save the other part of the production because uh, for reasons uh, that I might know uh, this makes sense or not. 
Um, but of course, uh, to do that, uh, automation and uh, machine learning um, can help you. Um, yeah, so this, uh, this, this will be the answer to, to what you asked. I have some remarks also to the things that were discussed before, but uh, yeah. So I, I think it's, it's still a valuable and a valid uh, cycle. It's very good. It's helping us to understand um, if we want to do cybersecurity, which uh, checklist uh, should we look at? How can we structure our actions? And uh, machine learning can help us in um, assisting us, for instance, by learning from different sites, synthesizing information, uh, pre-processing data for us, so that then we as humans um, can better decide on it and also on deciding on things faster, but um, I don't think that we can have 100% uh, automated based on whatever technology, uh, cybersecurity, for the reasons uh, that I was giving. Thank you. Um, before we get in, and, and first of all, uh, please um, <coughs> take the, 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 the possibility, maybe later if we get into the questions from the audience, to answer maybe a question that is directed to you, uh, to shortly answer that question and then get into remarks that you just uh, mentioned that you still have for the other panelists here on stage and for us. So um, uh, I hope we can, we can hear them a little bit later on. We're five minutes away from, from your questions. We want to get you on board here um, rather quickly. Um, again, please share your questions um, via the hashtag YC2022 uh, on YouTube via Slido, um, and then uh, I hopefully get to see them here on my tablet and then direct them um, to the panelists. But we will also have in five minutes, hopefully, a microphone uh, here in the audience. So for the audience members, uh, you are also invited to, uh, to ask questions in a couple minutes. Um, I have one last question for the panel, and I just decided to ask this question like openly into the panel, and then I, I, uh, I hope to get a, uh, an answer from each of you um, quite shortly and precisely. Um, I want to build a bridge here now a little bit towards policy, security policy, um, and just ask you um, what, um, with the dawn of AI technologies on the horizon and everything that we just talked about um, so far, um, how can uh, we create an effective political or institutionalized cyber defense on a European level, um, maybe <clears throat> on a state level, but then also thinking it towards a little bit towards Europe. Um, so to speak, what advice would you li like to give policy or decision makers um, within this current current development? Maybe, um, Joachim, you want to start? I'm not exactly sure what you precisely mean by cyber defense. That's, that's can, do you mean this in the military sense or in the in a, I general would, societal? I would I would actually say both. I would oh. say okay, we have on the one hand we have these all these consumers out there, and we have cyber yes. we have cyber attacks. I already, by the way, I saw a question that we will post then hopefully uh, in a couple of minutes by one of our uh, viewers about non-state actors in, in, in both cybersecurity, uh, conventional cybersecurity as we understood it, uh, namely attacks on, um, yeah, on consumers, mm, nice. but, then okay. also, but then also on structures and on military structures. But there seems to be also the threat, there seems to be also the threat of non-state actors in this arena. Um, but, if you, but if it comes to cyber defense, no, I'm, I'm not very both. knowledgeable yeah. in the military area, so I'll yeah. just leave that out because I don't know much what's going yeah. on there. Say, I think in the consumer world, I think it's pretty simple what needs to be done. I already said at the beginning there was around 2000 when the internet became commercialized and consumer technology essentially involved untrained people into making security decisions, security management, things like that. And that just doesn't work. I mean, as a very simple example, um, if you're not trained in computer science, I bet that you do not know what a certificate actually is. Also, you're all the time dealing with it. In your browser, you have this chain lock, which is open or closed. All this is based on certificates, but what exactly is a certificate? I bet 95% of all people just have no idea about it. So that's one problem, and I think we need to do Two things, we really need to think and worry about security management in the field at large, in consumer devices, in the IoT sense, also in the industrial sense. And in order to do proper security management, you need to understand what you're doing. So I think one thing has to happen, which is really a long-term goal. We need to go into schools and teach 
a basic understanding of cybersecurity. At the moment, this is not happening. Cyber literacy, some call it, I think. Oh. I, I well, they it. are starting to teach computer yeah. science in school. That's what service is happening. But this security look at it, this just doesn't appear there. So my daughter just finished school in Bavaria. She has never heard about it. And how should these people manage their own security? So in the long run, we really need to explain things and provide training. And this is, I think, something very basic. I mean, a huge part of our society is based on the digital space, and we need security, and we need to understand it. Second, and there I actually see chance for machine learning AI, maybe we can use this to take over routine tasks in security management, in managing keys and devices, and just free the people from doing that. Because AI and machine learning is good at doing routine things, and security management up to a certain point is something really routine. And that would be something which I think AI and machine learning might be really very useful and handy in order to free the people to deal with certificates of their coffee machines because they don't want to do that. They want coffee. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, Mark Oliver, I would shoot the question over to you now because uh, what uh, Joachim just said at the very beginning, um, that was, <coughs> I remember, a big uh, point last year, education, awareness, cyber literacy, bringing this to the people, <clears throat> people understand what we are talking about, the technical, in terms of the technical side. Um, your response. Uh, yeah, so um, I fully agree with uh, training and education being super important and um, would like to add, um, my goal would be that the people have educated trust into uh, the technologies that are getting developed because um, today they have false trust, so they trust in infrastructures such as Telegram that are centralized uh, where the data can be taken because media told them this would be a super secure way of messaging and if they would be more educated um, and certificates are clearly something ultra important in that to relate, uh, that would be good. <clears throat> to a uh, second point, um, you mentioned it already, so um, what I always tell people is that uh, cybersecurity, when you're on the uh, good side, on the white side, you want to have uh, things that run and you do not want to destroy them, then cybersecurity is a goal that you typically do not necessarily do not have as a nation state or a sub-country or a city or a company, but it's something that you want for the entire infrastructure because uh, your supply chain in any kind um, depends on it. And therefore, my uh, strong recommendation is think about collaborations, working together over um, country borders, over company borders, and so on. Putting the link to machine learning, um, it can offer the possibility because it abstracts on um, raw data and um, the insights regarding cybersecurity protection um, are something that uh, could be abstract enough in order to share it without um, putting any risk. And the third and last point um, that I find very interesting uh, recently, um, even though it's not a new point, but uh, again with the war in Ukraine, it became more clear to me again, is um, Starlink as uh, communication infrastructure, satellite base deployed by a private company in the US that is heavily backed by the state. And uh, this infrastructure helped um, maintaining something that, uh, according to press at least, Russia wanted to shut down early, namely the internet in Ukraine. And um, all the technologies, ML-based and not ML-based, they depend on data exchange. And for data exchange, we need a network, and the network, the global network is the internet. And uh, there was recently now a paper about uh, from Chinese scientists saying like, okay, this is how we can destroy the entire Starlink infrastructure. And uh, my point there is um, we also have to think about not separating, as I said at the beginning, um, civilian activities and uh, cybersecurity activities on a nation state level in that sense that autonomous cars can help you making also better defense technology and collecting information, cameras, as Sasha said, um, can do that. I mean, I don't want to go into the direction of China for that, to be clear. But um, 
the US and other countries are clearly using civilian companies and infrastructures in order to also fulfill cybersecurity and offensive and defensive goals. And uh, this is something that we could do more also in Europe in order to play in the same league um, because it's always an arms race and uh, we should not go uh, get uh, too long. Thanks. Thank you, Mark Oliver. Um, lastly, Sasha, let's, let's um, escalate this whole thing a little bit more. Um, the, as we say in German, sometimes um, the kid fell in the well. We are not educated. We have no idea. Um, we find ourselves in a, in a situation where the adversary um, is very well playing out his or her card on using these different things that we talked about today, um, especially in terms of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, very modern systems, and so on and so forth. And there's maybe a concert of different um, attacks in this space. What can we do? What are the, the major vulnerabilities right now? Um, and what is the message to policy and decision makers on this? Um, and maybe give this a slight, if you can, uh, European twist, because I think that the um, interconnectivity on, on this continent here, and especially within the U European Union, is significant and will increase over time. So we should think this in a European, um, in a European context. Yes, thank you. Um, I, would, um, I would, if I have the chance to give a recommendation to the European policymakers, I would say, um, uh, let's figure out how we move towards a democratic and liberal data-driven society. And I would suggest to do it through, say, uh, walk away from the centralized data. Centralized data is uh, controlled by the government. Uh, centralized data controlled by the government is one point of failure, and that's very vulnerable. I would say... Uh, move to uh, also move away from the federated data, which is uh, a federated ID, so to say, where companies like Facebook, uh, Microsoft, LinkedIn, they have federated ID, which they hold the data for the individuals. I would say uh, introduce the concept of, um, say, self-sovereign ID, where people have their own data. Uh, there are new technologies for that, and uh, you can you can move a society in that direction. Uh, that will create very different data dynamic. And then I would say, um, on the level of the uh, policy, make a decision, strategic decision, where you want to go. And as Europe, we should say, as a as a European Union, we should have. Uh, the uh, European military cloud, which is to serve the military and defense uh, purposes. And uh, then I would say, it's not for me, the government, to build it. I should create the ecosystem where private companies, and there was an interesting example how a U.S. company, private company, moved to help in the situation with Ukraine. So, the European uh, regulators and policymakers tend to rely on the big state too much. And that comes at the expense of private companies. And uh, the governments, and I, I served in the government to know that the governments in our society are probably know the least about the technology. Uh, they are not the most innovative. They are conservative by definition. They are risk averse. So create the strategic picture and then bring, create the ecosystem for, for startups and for developed companies to contribute in a fair competition. I'm also not a big fan in Europe of the government grants. I think it's a corrupt system. And I think it is a system where we give government a decision-making power of which AI company is best for them to choose. And the government that is risk averse and doesn't understand the technology is making that decision, bringing in that technology. 
And where the, what the government should do is should create the ecosystem for private money to be available to invest into what this private money is concentrated on. So say we should have more venture capitalists who, invent, who are investing in the AI companies that are identified by these people who have special degree and consultants and so on, how to do that. And all that should change the dynamic where the purpose is to create defense. The government should identify the strategy for doing that and give it to the private sector to lead it. The government should not claim the IP with the government. The government should protect the IP, but not claim it. What, what is a problem with the government is that they would first start by inviting you to develop ideas. And the moment you write ideas on the paper, the government immediately says, this is our intellectual property. So effectively, I'm in a position where I cannot innovate anymore. The government took my intellectual property away, so I cannot earn any, any living on this. And, and that's not stimulating. What the government should do is, please develop it for me, and I want to create a situation where you have this idea, great, go and develop it further, and there will be 10 other people like you and you compete with each other, and the best idea will come through, right? So it's that dynamic that needs to happen and back the strategic thinking that the government should have. That's how I would approach this. Uh, thank you very much. And there is already one question um, that would go in this direction. I'll ask this to you in really just a second. Um, now this is your turn. Um, do we have a microphone already at hand um, to, uh, to, for the audience to give? Um, maybe someone in the back can assist here. Um, we have a question here up in front, but until we uh, we'll get to uh, the fellow, um, there's one question from an anonymous user here, uh, Sasha. Maybe that goes in this direction that you just said. Is it the ethical and moral obligation of private companies to collaborate with governments for the benefit of enhanced security in cyberspace, but also AI? Obligation, a moral obligation of a company to collaborate. Um, I don't think so. I think the the moral obligation may come in the in the context of a crisis, but not of uh, commercial operations. The commercial operations are designated to create profit for the company shareholders. That's the purpose of the company, and the government should not put moral obligation. The government should create interest for the company to succeed in what they are doing. Of course, there is, like, for example, at Helsing, our logo is that we only serve liberal democracies. We have the index that we follow, and we would not talk to anyone who, who is not considered liberal democracy. This is, we do have a moral obligation, but it comes internally. It's what makes us good citizens in the society, rather than the government would tell us what our moral obligation is. This is, if you look at China, you have interesting situation where there are, the AI is developed by three main companies and then the 75% of startups that develop AI are owned by those three companies. And each of those companies has the Communist Party uh, leader inserted into this company because they have moral obligation to the Communist Party, they're working on this. That's not the society that we want to build. We are liberal democracy, we are capitalist society, and that's how we should beat the system that we are seeing that is centralized, that is authoritarian, that is not liberal. So we'll need to play our strengths. Right now, our strengths turn into our weaknesses, and so we need to convert that and play it the other way around. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from the audience. Please state your name and your question and to whom you want to ask this question. Hi, yeah, my name is Ben. Um, I guess it's for the whole panel. Uh, I don't have anyone specific in mind. I, but I, So there was mention already of uh, that the cyber security and, and cyber warfare is an arms race and that everyone's competing against each other. So I was wondering if you could say that there's sort of a cyber security dilemma going on where there's also... Uh, say one country invests more in, in AI and especially in warfare and then, then everyone else has to follow with them. So it starts out with, for example, the drone and artillery example, but then it goes up more and more and more when we get to nuclear weapons that there's no more human control at some point or, or very limited control. Um, and then in connection to that, that is 
especially after NATO, saying that cyber attacks can also now trigger Article 5. And I know of the UK government in the last defense review has also said a cyber attack can trigger a nuclear response. So with everything sort of moving out of the hands of humans that we're sort of getting into a range where it might be difficult to regain control at some point. Who wants to, who wants to go first on this? Oh, no, so <clears throat> did I get it right? You're sort of addressing this. Uh, will there be a cyber arms race? That that was largely. I I didn't quite get the very last part of your question. Sorry. Right. So so if we are losing control, basically because of this arms race or security dilemma, where everyone has to sort of go one step further than the than the, than the other, um, in, in in letting AI control the weapon system. Okay. Yeah, I mean, sure, there is there is risk, of course. I mean, this is a sort of situation where we'll almost certainly see an arms race, this is obvious, and it's a situation that we don't understand very well. So it's hard to see how to control this situation. And there's something else coming on top of that. Um, the situation between someone trying to protect the system, whatever it does, and someone trying to attack a system um, is very different. So if I want to protect a system against attacks, I have to find a way to prevent, let's say, every possible attack to happen. Then it would be really secure. As an attacker, I just have to find one way to attack it. So, in principle, it's always easier for an attacker to succeed with the goals than for the defender of an IT system to succeed with the goals, because it's much, much more complicated. So, <clears throat> and that's very interesting. So, you see, um, I mean, we see quite some hacking activities, say, from North Korea. And it's not very difficult to train people to get into the situation where they can attack IT systems of whatever kind. That's not hard, and that's done all the time. Um, train people to defend system is much, much harder, because as I said, you have to close every possible vulnerability. Now, let's take, let's say, Europe and North Korea, just to give an example, it could be anything. So, this is a very asymmetric situation. So, for, for a state like North Korea, it's comparably easy to attack the other side. What would you attack in North Korea? You see, there's much less attack surface, as we call it. And that's something very particular for the, for the cybersecurity space. And we, are not, we don't really have the tools to handle that properly. So I think there is a situation where we see escalation on both sides. And I'm not really clear where this is going to end up or what, how, we, how we will deal with this situation precisely. I mean, we can just try to secure things better and better, and that's getting harder and harder because the systems are getting more and more complex. And on the other side, you have the attacker, which just needs to find one hole, and the whole thing collapses. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, if I can add a little bit. Uh, uh, more as I mentioned, I, in my previous life, I was on the uh, management board of uh, Microsoft uh, for public sector worldwide. I negotiated the first cloud deals in history of NATO, uh, European Commission. And uh, there was a situation where, in that capacity, I, I came into the situation where the European Commission uh, was... Uh, completely penetrated uh, by a very serious malware uh, that no one could identify. In fact, the malware was so sophisticated that the moment you see it, it disappears. So people thought they were hallucinating uh, because, the, you know, I see it, I call you that you can look at it and it's gone. And so it's very hard to remove something that is not there. And uh, there were it was probably the first time in, in the history that I have seen that pretty much anyone who is someone in the cybersecurity space came to the table to see what to do. Effectively, what you had to do is to replace every server in the European Commission. And uh, that, was, uh, that wouldn't be possible to do. And to this day, we don't know <clears throat> who put that malware. 
But what was interesting as a part of the analysis was that there were five countries that were able to do that. Five countries were identified. It was Russia and China. It was Israel. It was UK and the US. And no other had capability to put something like this. So in a way, you can use this as an illustration as to countries or nations' readiness to attack something, whether friendly or not. And, and you can see who has the uh, who has the uh, capabilities. Uh, in terms of AI in the military space, and us people losing control, I think there is that risk, but before you address that risk, you have to address another risk, and that is that you have no capability whatsoever first, right? So you, you, we urgently as a society need to start developing capabilities uh, of, of using that kind of technology to defend ourselves because that technology will be used against us. And, uh, uh, and that's, that's how I would see this first. And then in parallel, we have to think how we create the moral uh, and ethics <clears throat> for um, making sure that it doesn't get out of control, right? So that's how I would sequence uh, the, uh, the approach. Thank you. Um, Mark Oliver, do you want to sh quickly share a couple yes. of uh, notes on this? Yes. So, um, uh, to what Joachim said, so the, um, an interesting thought is also that um, uh, the cybersecurity he was describing is the typical cybersecurity that we had, which is um, you have to protect against everything because um, you have to anticipate what can happen. So, it's a rather static. And uh, we are not there, but machine learning could provide also the, also the possibility in one day that we say, okay, our high level goal is availability of the service and uh, the AI or the machine learning learned how to dynamically detect and react and so on. Uh, so that could be an interesting development as well, uh, which we don't have yet. So we have what he was saying, but it could be an interesting perspective. To your question with the dilemma of the arms race, um, so for sure we have the arms race. Um, is it good or bad? I would say it's rather good uh, from the term that it's a technological development, so it's quite interesting. Um, but I want to add um, an interesting aspect that we did not talk about yet. And it's related to the ethics and moral question that we had before, because um, in the end, the uh, the response or one part of the response of Sasha was that everybody should have a moral compass, and not necessarily the moral compass of the state is the one uh, that has to be right. Um, okay, and that leads us to something interesting, which is um, community. Whistleblowing is something uh, that is important there. So Edward Snowden was deciding, okay, he wanted to publish uh, the information and he revealed um, also a lot of cybersecurity related um, risks or almost uh, only cybersecurity related risks. And um, the good thing is when we are in the cyberspace, um, things are at least theoretically open to everybody who's in the cyberspace. And we have a lot of activists and people that are also looking at what has happened there, doing investigations and so on. And uh, this I find a quite good thing because it's a kind of a third um, control and also contribution pillar. Story there also like when the, uh, when some supply trains uh, were hacked uh, from uh, somewhere from activists uh, maybe, or also from state actors. Uh, so in, in general, everybody who's connected to the network um, can access the things if he has enough resources and skills. And uh, this is also a powerful and interesting aspect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mark Oliver. Um, we most probably only have one question left, and that comes from uh, an anonymous user online. Um, I would like to address this to you, Sasha, um, and I also take the freedom to amend it a little bit here. Uh, the anonymous um, person says, what other cyber warfare techniques in Russia uh, is Russia using in the war? Um, what is the final goal in the cyber field? I would amend this in the following way. You just mentioned before that uh, Ukraine is under attack in several um, several ways in the cyber, in, in, with cyber attacks and in, in cyberspace and with different um, systems. Russia, however, was very unsuccessful in its campaign in the very beginning um, with uh, conventional military, uh, in conventional military ways. And I think we can all agree that they did not achieve, um, luckily, um, 
for Ukraine did not achieve um, their uh, goals in the very beginning. So the question that I would also pose then on top of this was, was uh, were there no plans for this in place or didn't we see any uh, major uh, cyber um, campaigns, go cyber uh, warfare campaigns going on? Was Were the attacks, if they were going on, too weak or was the Ukraine defense here very strong? And if the latter was the case, what can we learn from that? Right, it's a loaded question. So first of all, uh, let me take a position that would be controversial from the beginning. Uh, and that is that I do not buy into the notion that Russia is not succeeding in Ukraine, uh, primarily because uh, they by now occupy the territory that is Uh, would be half of the United Kingdom, half of country like Italy. And uh, they took the uh, strategic position to connect Crimea towards the, uh, to, with the mainland now. Uh, they took, they blocked, blocked the sea, uh, cut Ukraine from the trade uh, lines. They, uh, well, they, completely changed the social dynamic in the country. They changed the uh, politics. Uh, there are no politics anymore. Um, the uh, Ukraine is losing quite significant number of soldiers. Um, and um, it's, it's not helpful in the West or in Ukraine for that matter to underestimate what Russians are doing. They are Uh, they have, they are adjusting their strategies. Uh, you can say that some of their strategies failed, uh, but at the same time, the other strategies they are pursuing uh, relatively uh, successfully, but not easily. Um, I also would point to uh, the fact that it's not clear what the Western strategy and Ukrainian strategies are. It's not clear what the end game is what the victory would look like, what settlement should look like. All of that is something that uh, unclear uh, for policymakers in the West and in Ukraine, I believe. Um, and that makes us look a little bit like as we are running as headless chicken, right? So that's basically uh, would be my response to the uh, question about the success or not success. Cyber war... Uh, plays a role in this and um, what I believe Russians are using cyber now for is for intelligence gathering I believe they have a fairly well-defined system for that one thing to understand about Russia is that there are six groups that are involved in the cyber war it's uh, six battalions basically Uh, Russia for the last 50 years or so had, they have this Academy of FSB, which is the Federal Security Service. Uh, the Academy is in Moscow, and there is one department that for the last 30 years has been producing hackers, professional hackers. It's a, it's a black belt engineers that can crack any system. And that's like something that it's not easy to match But to anyone. And so that is, that, that's something that, what is interesting is that the Ukrainian head of the secret intelligence is a graduate from that academy. What makes it interesting here is that effectively it's former classmates are fighting each other on the ideological national, uh, along the ideological national lines. And um, so for now, it's a moderate warfare. What is what one needs to learn from Ukraine here is that, uh, again, Russians broke into everything that was centralized and they couldn't break stuff that was not centralized, right? So that's something that one has to, uh, has to learn. Uh, what also one has to learn is that Ukrainians make the national cloud, which was broke into. The European concept of the national cloud is an interesting dilemma because on one hand, we may have a secure, more secure cloud in the United States, but INS will be able to see everything. 
On the other hand, we run the risk of having it on our territory, which would be easier to uh, break in and uh, potentially compromise. So that's a policy decision. Um, the uh, Ukraine has old computer systems which did not run uh, the uh, legal software. That's the first thing. And second, they didn't have the uh, reasonable uh, security systems on this. Uh, they have the centralized ID system. So all of that make them more vulnerable. So if one wants to be less vulnerable, that you have to play the, the opposite game. Um, Russia created a very unique state. It's a mixture of mafia, the KGB gang, the uh, slices of democracy, believe it or not, uh, and uh, the history of patriotism, you know, this kind of Russian pan-nationalism and so on. And that is the strange the strange mix in the Russian society. And that, that society and that leadership operates on escalations. They constantly escalate and nothing is um, moral. Everything is moral, rather. Um, and so what we see here is that Russia is doing something and the West slowly is matching. We are now sending the artillery. We are sending the shells. We are trying to interfere on the cyberspace. Russia looks at and escalates higher. And so looks if the West is ready to match. And so the same in the cyber technology. Russia is watching whether the, the West will be and Ukraine will be able to match. It's always a step ahead in escalation. And uh, uh, so this is where the concern is for the European policymakers. They appreciate that Russia is ready to escalate. How far are we ready to go? If Russia starts attacking critical infrastructure through the cyber warfare, which Russia hasn't been doing yet, are we ready to match? Are we ready to interfere into the Russian nuclear power stations? Are we ready to open the dam so that the territory size of France is flooded? We can do that. But if we do that, that's, that's, the, the, that's the gloves off approach. And that's as, 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 as risky as the nuclear option, right? So that is, where, that is why we are not seeing this, right? It's good that we're not seeing this, uh, but it may go that way if the escalation continues. What a note to end this panel. Um, <laughs> this is it. This has been the cyber panel. Unfortunately, we have no more time um, to dive in a couple of very interesting questions here. Um, we will see that we may gonna um, try to answer these questions um, in the upcoming um, days, uh, maybe online. Um, maybe we try to get back to you panelists with these questions and get short answers to satisfy um, our viewers. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. The next panel continues in, I think, only 15 minutes. So at uh, 4.30, uh, <coughs> health panel on that then um, goes until uh, six o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I thank you very, very much for your participation um, here today. And, and also, Mark Oliver, um, for your participation. Thank I you. hope to uh, see you all here back again next year when we talk uh, again about cyber or maybe in between. Um, and with that, I um, yeah, wish you a, a very informative rest of this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.